here's a weird thing. Fellow jumped the gun. Apparently, uh, in Norway, he started. He thought it was the end of the world, probably, and started shooting at people, hunting people with his bow and arrow. <laughs> Says uh, detention here for Norway bow and arrow attacker. The guy went out on the streets with a bow and arrow. I mean, it's it's if it weren't so tragic, it's just comical that someone goes out. Can you imagine someone going out there with a bow and arrow hunting people? Unbelievable. And uh, yeah, we're seeing very weird things today. Is is this? Normal a guy says, "Well, I can't buy a gun, or they'll trace it, or whatever." So I'll buy a bow and arrow. You know, you got all these weird people out there. Okay, related to the vaccine, uh, people criticize me and say, "Whoa, Bill, you got the shot." Yeah, I got the shot because I'm going to be traveling, and so, or I hope to be traveling. And um, and one of the problems is that you know the governments everywhere are putting all kinds of restrictions to those people who don't get vaccinated. It's a, it's a big problem. It's a big headache. So all we can do is. Uh, you know, uh, either you fight City Hall and do not get uh, vaccinated and just fight it all the way, or you just bow down and say, okay, give me that vax once and for all and get it over with, you know, and that's my attitude. I, would, I don't think I have much to lose either way. And uh, here you can see how they're imposing this stuff on everyone. It says, U.S. Navy sailors will, who refuse vaccine will be expelled. The United States is going to cut down on, I think, like 40,000 some people that uh, in the Navy that are not willing to get the shots or they expect people not to get the shots. They say they will convince some of them, you know, uh, but others will insist on their religion, on their right to their opinion or whatever, and uh, they won't get the shot. <laughs> and they'll be out of uh, commission, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. Uh, either you fight City Hall or you just accept it and say, well, you know, uh, we can't avoid the shots from now on. It's gonna, they're going to make it ever more difficult on people uh, to stay without, you know, the vaccine. And so it's up to you. If, if you've got no, no big issues out there, yeah, you can skip it and say, I'm not going to get the vaccine. But if you got to go to work, if you got to travel, if you got to do stuff out there, you're going to be a lot of trouble. <laughs> They're going to make life very difficult for you if you don't get the shot. Okay. And here you see a couple uh, uh, headlines. U.S. to live curves for November 8th for vaccinated foreign travelers. And you can see how they're kind of nudging you into getting the vaccine no matter what. Okay. And another article there, should passengers be vaccinated or tested to fly within the U.S.? So, yeah, especially for travelers, it's going to be a serious problem. They're going to make like quite difficult for you. And, yeah, you can say, I'm not going to get the, the vax, right? Okay, uh, you won that one. They'll win all the others. <laughs> so, I don't know. I can't tell you. All I can tell you is, you know, for me, it's not a big issue either way. Uh, I don't know too much about vaccines either way. I don't care about them. Never, it's a subject that doesn't interest me at all. Uh, but, you know, uh, I decided that it's better to fall in line and get the vaccine and not go through the hassle of all this stuff. Other than that, I don't care about the vaccine. Uh, someone here, I think, said, um, sad to see the side effects of your recent experimental treatment are already setting in. Yeah, I think I got a little bit sick uh, with this, uh, especially the second shot that I got. And uh, what, what it is, is that, uh, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I'm sneezing. And I got a little bit of sore throat, both mild, mild, and but and a little bit of runny nose also, all, all of them very mild. But, you know, I think it's related to the COVID because, uh, shot because, you know, I, I, when I get a cold, it's, it's serious. You know, I, I go to bed like for a week at least. And, uh, and here nothing happened. It's just that a little bit of cold, like a very, very mild cold. But, yeah, I felt the difference. So... Uh, I think it, the vaccine did something to me. It, you know, maybe my body's reacting to to whatever they put in there, whatever poison they put in there. And uh, but they say there are some um, some reactions from the body, especially when you get the second one. And I think that's what it was. But yeah, again, I, I don't care. But as long as it doesn't kill me, I'm, I think I'll I'll be okay. Uh, do, am I protected against the COVID? I have no idea. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's 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 just opinion as far as I'm concerned uh, from people who are not into that subject matter, right? Now I, I do understand the the um, theory, you know that I understand it. Now whether that translates into reality, well, that's another thing, you know. And right now, um, the jury's out in my mind. They're still working out there inside the courtroom. <laughs> Okay, uh, relating to women, one fellow says, there's a book called The Art of War for Women. There you see it, okay? Forget everything you think you know about strength, strategy, and success. Shows women how to use Sun uh, Tzu's philosophy to win every aspect of life. Sun Tzu was um, 
he, he was a Chinese guy who wrote the art of war, but he wrote it for men, <laughs> you know, how to fight in the battles out there. And someone uh, used that and say, uh, art of war for women. And a fellow says, shows women how to use, uh, Sun says, uh, philosophy, okay? Modern women are interested in equality. Uh -huh. When they already rule over men with covert, <laughs> heinous backstabbing and feminine uh, seduction. Whoa, okay, that's a good theory. <laughs> there isn't much of a drive to catch up to men physically. They are better at dominating in feminine ways. Uh, there, there's a famous saying that behind every successful man, there is a woman. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, yeah, to some degree, I, I think that's true. You know, uh, if you have a wife and your girlfriend, usually wife, right? Uh, she nudges you to do things. <laughs> it's part of living, uh, co you know, uh, learning to cohabit within a house. You know, you, you have to kind of respect her. She's got to respect you. And uh, she says, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? She, she's your counselor, you know? And it works in the other direction as well, especially in this, these days. You know, uh, men also uh, give uh, recommendations to women, to, to their spouses. You know? Uh, but yeah, I, I think you could say that women don't need the art of war of really matching men in strength of power because they have other tools, other weapons. <laughs> okay, that's okay. Good theory. Fellow says, I'm friends with some world-class female wrestlers and they can't compete with the men. Yeah, nobody's saying they can compete with the men. Um, what you have really is um, like, you know, if you have uh, unisex categories for fighting. We're talking about fighting, really tough sports out there, right? And you have professional women and you have professional men. And let's make it unisex. Now they all fight against each other within their uh, weight category. If they want to give some advantage to the women, you know, uh, saying, okay, we're going to let a little heavier woman. Uh, in other words, women will be able to, at least at the beginning, have a higher weight than women, than men, so that they can more or less be a little more equal. You know, they can play around with those things. But let's say there's a unisex uh fighting uh for for anything for boxing for kickboxing for any wrestling whatever uh right now yeah i think uh pound for pound man for man uh you know every man uh not every man but most men will beat most women i'm sure there's a lot of women out there within the same weight category that are probably skilled uh, better skilled or more skilled than some of the men and they would probably beat them so even within the weight categories i think it would be all men first and then all women second i think you would have them you know, interspersed. Uh, women will be up there uh, better than some of the men. And all I'm saying is, if you let that go for, I don't know, 100, 200 years, will women gradually come up the speed and be up to par with men? Will there be more women in the upper ranks in that, you know, in that whole ranking? And the answer that I have is, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and one of the things that you know, has kept up from kept us from seeing this is the fact that throughout the centuries, you know, men kept women uh, kind of down, uh, and women also chose a lot of the things that women typically do. You know, like the kitchen, the uh, rearing of kids, and so on, because that's what they inherited from their grandmothers and, and you know the forefathers. But now, you know, uh, starting with the service economy, women started coming out um, of the house and started to work. And a lot of the work out there does not require any strength or anything like that. It just requires certain abilities. And if the woman uh, studies, uh, she can be just as good or even better than some of the men. And what's happening in the world of boxing and some of these uh, heavy sports, a lot of these uh, women, um, you know, they go in there because of money, fame. Uh, a lot of them like to, you know, lift weights and so on. They get into that, those kinds of things. And yeah, they, you know, they, they get into that field and they can be very good. They can be very good, just much better than some of the men in the same weight category. So yeah, right now, if we put them, if we rank them, I'm sure, or we put them like unisex right now, I'm sure most women will be at the bottom half and most men will be at the top half. And again, I'm saying most, there will be women who beat a lot of the men. But given enough time, will that change in such a way that women move up the ranks? I would suspect that it would happen uh, whether they will always match or whether will, there will be a champion woman within a category. Well, I don't know. I can't tell you that. Uh, again, uh, the only thing I think would interrupt that right now is the extinction of man. If you give uh, us another hundred years, who knows? Maybe uh, women will have a champion in, in a given category. Okay, another fellow says it would be interesting to see and experience a matriarchal society, but the feminist movement or whatever that's promoting uh, masculine women that we have right now is mostly due to politics, ergo, not natural. 
uh, yeah, okay, uh, there is uh, an important element of politics there. The reason why women of the, of the current age have an increasing social standing is not due to their natural competence in relative, in relative to men, but simply because they are intentionally promoted by powerful men at the expense of common men for political reasons. Um, I think a lot of that is promoted by women, not so much by men. Uh, you know, you heard of NOW, uh, uh, National Organization for Women. You know, they're promoting a lot of the uh, fem uh, feminist uh, politics out there. Not only men, it's a lot of women that are pushing for their own rights. So don't say that, you know, we're giving them anything. No, they're, they're coming and taking it. <laughs> okay, so I don't know. Um, again, uh, you got to look at these uh, movements and find out who's behind them. There could be men behind them for political and uh, profit reasons. But I think the majority are women just requiring and requesting or demanding, really, their rights. You know, their equality in, in many aspects. And some of those equalities are showing up in these heavy sports, in this fight, these fighting sports. Okay, okay here we have a uh, Norwegian gender equality paradox occurs in Norway, uh -huh, in one of the most progressive countries. Okay, yet on average, women become even more womanish in their choices uh, there. Uh, non STEM, non dangerous, and social jobs. STEM being science, technology, I can't remember what the E is, math is the M. Uh, so they're not into the scientific, traditionally. Uh, male dominated fields that's what they're saying i don't think that's true or it's not it's it's that's fading i think a lot of women are coming up even in those uh, categories they're coming up to speed lately there are more women now in college than men and men are just bumming out i guess uh, a lot of them are frustrated they're uh, you know their life is over as they say and women are taking advantage of that and saying you know they're or just going to college and then taking advantage of their educations over a lot of the men who are you know just getting out of the field and so that's happening as well. But, you know, uh, in uh, Calhoun's experiments, um, for those of you who are familiar with them, uh, you know, the female mice, uh, they became more aggressive. They became less female. And the main point there was they stopped reproducing. Okay, and that's my biggest point when I talk about uh, all these equality, all these things, or I talk about the fact that women have, are become more masculine, masculinized. And by that, I don't really mean that, you know, they got testosterone in them. I'm saying primarily, uh, they don't want to reproduce anymore, okay? And you can't get them to have kids. And so that's the big portion that will influence extinction, okay? So that's why I focus on that subject. If we don't have kids, we don't have demand. If we don't have demand, uh, the economy falls to pieces. Human economy, the artificial economy we created, is based on this um, uh, progression where you have more and more demand next year uh, to drive companies to sell more and more goods. Therefore, they hire more people. That's the notion. But if you have fewer and fewer consumers because women are not producing children, are not producing population, well, at some point, you know, that turns a corner, becomes asymptotic, which it is right now. It's moving in that direction. And at some point, it either levels out or falls or and it supposedly goes more or less uh, uh, constant from then on. And I'm saying that's not going to be the case. You either continue increasing, go constant, or fall down to extinction. And I'm saying we're going to go down to extinction. Once we level off and, and hit that plateau, that zenith, it's going to go down to extinction. That's my take on that. Okay, uh, now a fellow says, uh, if I can get here. Uh, the basic problem with equality, again, between the sexes, lo lots of guys answered on this, <laughs> is that it buys into the white masculine standards it claims to be viciously against. Uh -huh. White nationalists and anti-racists disagree only on the science or history, not whether being primitive is such a bad thing. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, you do have people uh, out there, especially men, right? Uh, in the world of men, uh, they're threatened by this equality. And, and they, so they, what they do is they move to the extremes. They either say, oh, we have to stop women from becoming our equals. And, uh, and they want to limit the rights of women because they see that as a threat to their masculinity. And all I can tell you is you can't stop it. You can't stop it. And again, Calhoun's experiment shows how the males stopped reproducing with the females. And uh, females became more aggressive. You can say they became more masculine, right? You had uh, homosexual, um, uh, mice, and uh, again, that was documented. And so, you know, uh, males mounting males. And so you have this situation that really reflects our own society today in many ways. So I think Calhoun's experiments, which have been essentially censored by the uh, psychology and psychiatry establishments, 
I think people should really look more into uh, his experiments and especially his conclusions. I think they are a microcosm of what is happening to man. Okay, okay a fellow says, yeah, it says, I don't get why some dudes are so, uh, feel so insecure and emasculated that they get scared of women defying gender roles and norms by getting good at fighting. Uh, it's what pays well today, yeah. And uh, what the hell do they expect? It is also because we live in a comfortable city service economy, yeah. Celebrities, athletes, authors are the new gods of this new sedentary urban hominid. Uh, homin, homin, okay, urban hominid, I guess. So, of course, even women are seeking glory any way they can be it through beauty or traditional male athletic competitions and hobbies. Yeah, we're in a leisure society, and that's what service economy is. You don't do the work yourself, you hire it out. You need someone to fix your electricity, well, you don't do it yourself, you hire someone. You need landscaping, you hire someone. And, and so a lot of people uh, have home office, among other things, but what they do is they, um, they look at things through the internet, and they, they're, we're all into entertainment. A great majority of the uh, economy today is driven by entertainment, whether it's travel or whatever you do through the internet. What do people go through the internet for? A lot of them go for entertainment. And, uh, and again, it's all abstract. All we're doing is exchanging money around. Services does not produce absolutely anything per se. It produces only when that uh, money that circulates in the service economy somehow trickles over to manufacturing and agriculture or construction, you can say that's part of manufacturing in the sense that we're manufacturing a street, manufacturing a bridge or whatever. So it's only when it translates into manufacturing or agriculture that we have something real being produced. And you can say at that point, now we actually have uh, real growth in the economy. As long as we're sending money around, you know, paying a guy to sing and the other guy to do a program and the other guy to have, you know, sex with a prostitute, none of that produces anything real. Any, any growth, any real growth. So, it, it, and the problem here is that uh, agriculture and manufacturing not only have become, but are still becoming smaller and smaller percentages of the economy. What's growing is services. More people are getting in there and it's more a bigger percentage of GDP. How long can we continue doing that, producing stuff that is not productive at all? And I mean, the real productive stuff like agriculture and manufacturing uh, shrink day by day. This is the issue. That's why I'm saying you can't continue that forever, and right now we are continuing it forever. That's the problem. Okay, uh, here's uh, another comment. Th th says, Defining sex with only chromosomes creates a loophole that, in fact, trans people use. Okay, irrelevant. That was a good surface definition you gave with the chromosomes, but not quite. Uh -huh. Sex is more than just chromosomes. It's the whole body mechanism. Well, you know, the way, the way I look at it is that... Um, you want to know if a guy is a male or a female? I don't care if he had a sex change operation or she, you know. It doesn't really matter. You look at their chromosomes and you'll find out if they got, you know, XX or XY. And then you'll know what, what they really are, what category they belong to, and what bathroom they should go to. <laughs> okay? I think, uh, I, I don't know of any exceptions to that where, you know, uh, there's some guy out there that might, or gal, uh, that has a mixture of chromosomes. I don't know. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, it's XY and XX. Maybe there are some exceptions, but again, the few exceptions would not justify changing the rule that I'm suggesting. I'm saying we should just determine uh, who's male and who's female by their chromosomes. I don't care what they have in their brain. I don't care if they think this way or that way. I think we should just leave it to, you know, the chromosomes. It's subjective. The other one is subjective. You know, the guy says, I think I'm a woman. Well, yeah, maybe if you think you're a woman, then that's great. But, you know, your body says something else. So I don't know. That's my take on that. And yeah, the, one, the question you should ask is, why are we having so many of these these days? Okay, uh, suddenly, you know, they started all coming out of the uh, closet, all these transsexuals. And the question is, is this something genetic? The fact that we've been inbreeding for 200,000 years and now it's catching up with us, especially now that our population has increased dramatically in the last 200 years. I think it's all related to that. Okay, a fellow says, <laughs> did your wife already catch up to you and force you to spread feminist propaganda? <laughs> Yes, honey, please, please don't hit me. I, I, I'll say whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, uh, women are tough, you know, especially when they have that. <laughs> what is it there? Dough roller? <laughs> yeah, she caught up with me. Uh, she tells me what to say here, and I better say it because he's got a gun pointed at me right now, so I better be nice <laughs> and say it like she wants it said, okay? Okay, another fellow says, uh, organization. So I was wondering why it is that people are leaving the countryside. 
okay? What I learned is that people aren't moving out of small towns so much as small towns are getting so overpopulated. In other words, he's saying, it's not that you're in this little country village and uh, people are living, leaving the village because there's no work or whatever and they go to the big city because they can do a lot better over there. Uh, what's happening, he's, uh, he's saying, according to what he looked at, is that the little villages are becoming towns and the towns are becoming cities. They're growing. And so they're disappearing as uh, country cities country towns, country villages, and they're becoming metropolitan areas. That's what he's suggesting. Um, and what I'm saying is, um, I've got a different take on this. He says, now sure how that fits into your theory, but I personally had it backwards. I thought that these towns were drying up. I think both things are happening, okay? Both things are happening. And either way, it's uh, more or less irrelevant. You can see the chart right at the bottom. Uh, in the last uh, couple hundred years, urbanization has increased dramatically. People have left the country and come to the city. They've done that partly because the big corporations have bought out the farms, bought out the land, and they, they have these uh, uh, economies of scale in which they produce food for 8 billion people. And the little farmers, the guy that's losing out, little by little, they're being kicked out of the farms, either because they can't pay the bank loans or for totally different reasons. Uh, maybe the new generations don't want to farm anymore, whatever. And all these people are moving to the uh, towns and from there to the cities. And at the same time, you know, you do have uh, little towns that are growing and becoming cities. So I think both things are going on. The important thing is what you see there, that urbanization is the, is the direction in which we're going. And, you know, I saw, uh, I showed my um, little uh, gift there uh, where uh, you have uh, some fruits and you have the bacteria or the uh, whatever, the uh, fungus grow on it exponentially at first, and then at some point the whole thing collapses and dies. Why? Because, you know, at some point you can't continue reproducing bacteria over anything or fungus over anything. It's a matter of what the ratio is. At some point, you know, uh, there's going to be a density dependent birth rates for that species, and they're going to stop expans expanding exponentially. They're going to hit the plateau and come back down. And I think that's what's going to happen to man in, in, in the sense that we move to the cities. The cities are growing fast. Yeah, we've had growth in the last few 50 years, especially. And then, uh, I'd say even from the 1950s, right after the war, right? And then what happened? Uh, at some point, you know, you can't continue having uh, millions and millions, more millions of people like in New York City or in Tokyo or the big cities around the world. At some point, that's going to stop. Okay? Because, you know, you just can't fit physically more people in that little, in, in that big town. Okay? And that's the issue. Uh, at some point, it's going to level off, and that's what what I call density-dependent birth rates. You know, and yeah, if you look at density-dependent birth rates, there's been a lot of studying uh, on that, especially for animals. Uh, but uh, of course, they recognize that it applies to man as well. We're part of the wild kingdom. Okay, okay here we have another one. Uh, it says Conference of the New World Order, 2015. And this is a statement that was pulled out of there. I have not been able to verify this. I had no time to look this up. But the fellow says, apparently he's quoting someone there at the conference, says, because the intention of the, uh, of the uh, New World Order is to reduce the number of people in this world, at the time when the New World Order was initiated, the population of this world was only 3 billion, which was around the time when I was born, in the 50s. Okay? And um, the intention was to reduce to 1 billion. Now the population of the world is 7 billion, yeah, okay? And there will be a need to kill many billions of people or to starve them to death or to prevent them from uh, giving birth in order uh, to reduce the population of this world. So uh, the New World Order, apparently, uh, assuming this uh, statement is true, um, is that uh, they, they want to reduce the population of the world. They say we're, we're too many already. And we got a problem with that because on the one hand, yeah, that's great for uh, resources and it's great for... Um, the ratio of resources to man, and that's on the one hand. But on the other hand, we got a problem because, you know, our economy is based on more and more people, more demand. And so there's a contradiction between uh, pollution and all this other stuff related to high population and a contradiction with the business world that requires more and more people in order to have more and more demand. And so by, let's say, let's say uh, you know, by an act of God, we chop off uh, 3 billion or 4 billion of our population. So we got 8 billion people, we chop off 4 billion, we're left with 4 billion people. Are we better off or, or worse? I mean, you might say, well, we have less pollution now, this, this, and that. Yeah, great. How about business? Now the business suddenly has much less demand and closes its doors, kicks everybody out of the, the uh, j their jobs, and now you kill the economy. 
So yeah, you need more population. And again, uh, it's an inverted pyramid scheme what you're talking about. You need more and more population for our global economy to continue thriving. If you stop population growth, you're doing excellent stuff for pollution and climate change, all that stuff, and you're doing terrible stuff for the economy, the economy will shut down and we're all dead anyways, one way or the other. So it's a no-win situation. We're dead one way or the other. Okay, um, well, says, or someone says, have military strategists considered that both China and Taiwan have operable nuclear power reactors used for electricity generation? Yeah, a major conflict could result uh, in uh, could possibly result in damage to the water cooling loops, causing possible core meltdown and spent fuel rod storage pools boiling dry. Yeah, if there is a nuclear war, uh, forget it. If they start throwing the nukes, uh, we're all dead. I don't think we can come out of a nuclear exchange because uh, you know it's, it means that all stops are off. You know, if, if someone throws their first bomb to the other side, it's a free-for-all. Everybody will just let go of the bombs before the other guy destroys the bombs locally. You know, and you have submarines out there, and they can shoot, uh, you know, their bombs. And you can locate the submarine, submarine and maybe throw a bomb there and blow it up, but maybe it throws, throws the uh, bomb before you blow it up, and it wipes out a million people in a city. So, you know, I, don't, I, you know, I think that's why nobody's right now uh, really uh, uh, very happy about trying to push the red buttons. But if someone pushes the red button tomorrow because they want to win the war, a conventional war or they're losing a conventional war and they say, well, I'm just going to throw the bomb in and liquidate, you know, the other guy's army or navy or whatever, we're all in trouble because at that point, everybody will press the buttons. That's the way I see it. I don't think we'll come out of a nuclear exchange. So yeah, nobody better touch those red buttons. Those buttons hopefully will never be touched, even though it might happen at the last moment anyways, you know. Okay, the U.S. does uh, have a choice in whether or not they go to war with Taiwan. Uh, their fear that China is uh, doing better than the U.S. has become a stronger world power is not a good reason for starting a war with them. The U.S. is, all, is jealous of them, and it's not their country, so they should stay out of it. Taiwan is part of China. It's still not any other country's place to actually interfere, much less start wars over it. Yeah, see, uh, one thing is ideal. People have these ideals about justice, what uh, justice should be. And apparently this person says, the uh, United States has, States has no business being in Taiwan. Hey, or, yeah, or fighting against China by, you know, uh, giving weapons to Taiwan first. And if China happens to attack, get involved in the fight and defend Taiwan. But that's the way politics has always been. I mean, you know, uh, uh, in Argentina, we had the uh, Falkland War. Uh, did the Falkland uh, uh, Islands belong to Argentina or to <laughs> Great Britain? Well, the way it's uh, settled is by going to the field and fighting. That's the way it's settled. <laughs> Otherwise, it doesn't get settled. Taiwan's going to be no different. You know, they're not going to resolve that by saying, okay, let, let's uh, sign a treaty and Taiwan becomes a, a country of its own with its own rulers. China's not going to stand for that. China's going to work its way all the way to conquering Taiwan. Remember, Taiwan came into being only because, you know, Chiang Kai-shek uh, escaped after, uh, to Taiwan after uh, Mao uh, beat him in the Civil War. And so China became communist because, you know, Mao Im imposed communism uh, in China, so-called communism, uh, dictatorship of the proletariat. And the, the island, uh, Taiwan, is the only one that escaped that fate because, you know, Chiang Kai-shek immediately, you know, created all these defenses against mainland China. So as one grew, the other one grew as well. And now, several generations later, these people are saying, hey, Taiwan is part of China. And the Taiwanese are saying, come here and prove it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of problems out there, and there's a result by weapons. They're not resolved by what is justice, who something belongs to. You know, uh, what was it? Um, the Monroe Doctrine said that, uh, you're talking about the early 1800s, right? Uh, when the United States was an enemy of England, of the United Kingdom, of Great Britain. And people don't realize that, but throughout the 20th, uh, 19th century, England and the United States were enemies. Today, their friends, it's hard to believe that. In, in those days, they were enemies. And England did everything possible to uh, destroy the United States, to break it up. Civil War, they took the side of the South, etc. They wanted to break up this big uh, country that was developing out there. And uh, the Monroe Doctrine, uh, the, issued by James Monroe, you know, he said, look, uh, anything involving the Americas, we're going to uh, go against Europe, no matter what. You know, America for the Americas, essentially. That was the Monroe Doctrine. And when the Falkland War happened, uh, Argentina and some other countries in South America said, hey, remember the Monroe Doctrine? 
uh, and the United States said, well, you know, we, we're going to take the side of, of the Europeans in this case. And so they pick, they pocketed their, uh, the Monroe Doctrine and used another doctrine. They use whatever they need at the, whatever time they need. And that's the same for every country in the world. I mean, does Israel control uh, the Middle East there, that country called Israel? Uh, you've got the West Bank, right? you got these uh, pieces of land that are occupied by Arabs that lost the war in 1967. They don't care. They just take the land. How about the Golden Heights uh, in uh, Syria? That's land taken by, the, by Israel. And Israel is now saying, well, that's our land now. And Syria can go fight it out in the United Nations. Good luck there, you know. No, they're going to have to fight for it. They're going to have to send an army there and beat the uh, settlers, the Israel army that's occupying the land. And if they can't do it, that land belongs to whoever can defend it. That's how simple it is. It has nothing to do with justice. Justice is like, uh, what was it? <laughs> Mao said to him, he said, you look at justice through the barrel of a gun. <laughs> and that's the best way to put it. Okay, changing a little bit of the subject here, we have something about the Neanderthals. What is your opinion on the Neanderthal super predator theory? Parts of his theory is that Neanderthals were basically nocturnal, okay? If so, this might explain how Homo sapiens were able to drive uh, the much larger and physically stronger Neanderthals extinct. Aha, uh -huh, okay? This was done by attacking Neanderthal man during the day while they were asleep. <laughs> Okay, it also might explain where one our tales of werewolves and vampires came from. <laughs> okay, uh, what can I tell you? Uh, this theory of uh, the Neanderthal super predator comes from this fellow. His name is uh, Danny uh, Vendramini. And he, this, he says that um, Neanderthal did not look like what the uh, establishment puts out there. It looks a little different. It, it looks like that gorilla that you see there, big, etc., mean looking. Uh, he had an artist uh, make this, uh, this image of Neanderthal. Okay, and uh, I agree with some things with uh, Mr. Vendramini, uh, and so all I can do is show you what I agree with him. And the first one that I disagree is uh, the looks. I'm saying it looks more like that, which is the, uh, perhaps one of the first, maybe it was the first um, Neanderthal that was uh, uh, imaged, and that was in 1909. And I think that's more or less what uh, Neanderthal looked like. This other one, the one that he points out, looks more like a monster. I don't think any animal would look quite like that. So in that sense, we agree that this animal, this Neanderthal, was hairy. Uh, he was living in the Arctic, he developed in the Arctic. Okay, so um, he, he wore no clothes, as you can see, and I don't think he wore any clothes. I think humans did, you know, Cro-Magnons. Uh, we did wear clothes. And I think uh, also that Neanderthals were stronger and better built for fighting than each individual man. So I think they were much uh, formidable, uh, much more formidable in, the, uh, in, in, uh, in any fighting category. Okay? So I think they were tough uh, groups. They also fought, uh, worked in clans. They worked together. So they had many advantages in that sense. Uh, uh, where do I disagree with him? Well, I disagree with him in that sense that um, he says that uh, the Neanderthals, let me get rid of this, says that the Neanderthals um, moved around and uh, they went from Europe around the Black Sea and into the Middle East because they found some Neanderthals in the Middle East. And so Vendermini says that, well, we had humans come from Africa. They met with the Neanderthals there in, uh, in the Levant, especially in uh, Israel, Syria, and Iraq. And that's where we find some bones. And uh, humans uh, killed them. They, we were superior to the Neanderthals. Again, that's that. They killed them during the day while the other guys slept at night. That's why we were able to get rid of the Neanderthals. Now, the Neanderthals did not die because humans got rid of them in any way, shape, or form. Humans had nothing at all to do with the extinction of the Neanderthals. We did not mate with them. We never had sex with them. He also mentions that, by the way, that uh, the Neanderthals were raping our women. You can, you can imagine that monster uh, sleeping with one of our ladies. I can't. I don't think he would. It's uh, like a lion trying to uh, sleep with uh, one of the wild dogs out there in Africa. I don't think a lion would do that. Okay. But anyways, the, the issue is that um, I don't think that Neanderthals went around the Black Sea to the south to warm climates such as Israel, the Levant. Uh, Neanderthals never had a reason to leave Europe because it was sufficient. There was more than enough game. First of all, their populations were relatively small. And because humans went up north to Europe, and why did they go there? I think they followed the herds. I think 
uh, humans were looking for game. Game was probably scarcer in the south, in uh, Africa and so on. The, the uh, animals were somehow apparently going north or maybe the humans were just drifting northwards as they looked for game and they eventually ended up in Europe. And the only reason that humans were able to finally enter Europe is because the Neanderthals were gone. The Neanderthals uh, were imploding. The population of Neanderthals were imploding. Apparently they ended up, I think, either in what is known as Yugoslavia, that region there, or Spain. That's, I think, one of those two places. Maybe they made their last stand. Maybe it was Italy. But that's where they probably made their last stand. More than likely, it was over there in Gibraltar. But they imploded. Their population imploded. Uh, humans had nothing to do with it. Uh, the only reason humans entered Europe is because the Neanderthals were dying, were disappearing, and, and now humans were able to walk in there. That's, that's my take on that. So uh, Vendramini's notion that this was because humans killed them or that the uh, uh, Neanderthals had sex with our women, uh, and the other one that Neanderthals were in the Levant. Uh, there's a couple studies out there, I mentioned them in the past, and that's that the Neanderthals in the Levant are not uh, even similar. Now, I can't say not at all, but they're not, there are many differences between the Nand so-called Neanderthals in the Levant and the Neanderthals in the West, like in France, uh, Spain, and uh, Germany. There's differences, you know, noticeable differences. So I don't think what they found in the Middle East are Neanderthals. Okay, there was some other hominid that was living there. Uh, we were still evolving. Uh, whether those are our ancestors or somehow they died out and humans later came out, that's uh, you know we don't have enough samples out there to be able to decide that in any way, shape, or form. I can only make assumptions, and my assumptions is that um, uh, the uh, hominids that we find in the Middle East were not either humans or uh, Neanderthals. They were some other species, like you have the Denisovans in Russia and so on. I think these were different species just scattered throughout the planet. Okay, and uh, yeah, and here is the where we agree with Mr. Vendramini, and that's, uh, you know, uh, what they've done, the establishment, they've made uh, Neanderthals ever more human-like over the century. You can see from 1909 to 2015 how Neanderthal has uh, modified uh, his aspect. He, he's become more more like us, okay? So much so that in the Neanderthal Museum, uh, they put some clothes on him. Uh, you know, the guy's got suit and tie. <laughs> and like saying, you know, if you see a Neanderthal out there, you would not recognize him. I think you would. I think he looks more like that guy on the left-hand side. Okay, and uh, final issue here, uh, same person I think says, here's a video which calls into question the out of Africa theory, okay? There are multiple other pieces of evidence that call this theory into question, including early hominids existing in South America, okay, thousands of years ago. Fossil discoveries in China, which placed early man there much earlier than he should have been. And evidence that proto-man emerged from Australia 50,000 years ago it interbred with another form of hominid, hominid uh, to produce what, they, uh, what we know as Homo sapiens. Okay, all I can tell you is um, that my theory has to do with the overturning of the population pyramid. That's how the Neanderthals died. And I think uh, um, humans did originate in Africa, primarily because we don't find Homo habilis anywhere other than in Africa, at least so far. The day we find a Homo habilis in China or in Indonesia or whatever, then maybe we can change our uh, perspective. But right now, you know, and I put that in my book, How the Neanderthals Disappeared, um, uh, I talk about the Chinese in there. I also talk about Homo erectus, uh, who was uh, also all the way up to China and uh, Indonesia. And what I'm saying is those guys did not originate in China or in Australia or in Indonesia. Now, I think uh, the out of Africa theory is correct. And that's the assumption I make for all this. I'm saying that we came out of Africa, uh, Homo erectus did, and he's the, guy, the ancestor of Neanderthals and also of some of the uh, uh, hominids that we see in the East. But I think what happened essentially is that um, after Homo erectus, uh, went east, their population somehow disappeared, and new waves of humans coming out of Africa repopulated China and Australia. And so that's my take on that. There's, we, uh, as of today, we have relatively little evidence. There are very few skeletons found uh, in China, and again, they're still looking for, for stuff. Maybe we had a head start in the West. We found a lot of skeletons, especially in Europe, and I don't think, I don't think you'll, we have yet found enough bones in China to be able to make any uh, conclusive uh, uh, or, or come up with conclusive theories, something more uh, that can be sold out there. Right now, I think what we find in, in China is that 
they were repopulated by humans coming from Africa. And that's, that's my take until I see something different. Those are the assumptions I make. So yeah, this is my take here, uh, the overturning of the population uh, pyramid. And I'm saying that Neanderthals died when their population pyramid overturned. And what are we saying there? Uh, one study, okay, now you see the study says, adult longevity increased with human evolution from a ratio of old to young adults of about 0 0.12 to 0 0.4 for Neanderthal fossils, with a particularly dramatic increase in Paleolithic societies to more than two older adults for each younger adult. What had changed over uh, the years, from maybe 300,000, 400,000 years ago to when the Neanderthals disappeared around 40,000 years ago, the Upper Paleolithic, what changed was the ratio of old to young people, their population pyramid overturned. And if you look it up and do some research out there, you can look up a couple of my videos on the Neanderthal series where I talk about it and I mention the, um, the uh, papers, the references. Um, their genetic diversity also decreased from about 80,000 years ago to when they disappeared 40,000 years ago. In those 40,000 years, you can see that there is a loss of genetic diversity among the Neanderthals. They were able to measure that. Whether you want to believe in that or not, uh, it does fit my theory quite well. So both of these, the fact that they lost their genetic diversity and the fact that they became older as time went by, gives me a clue that their population pyramid overturned because they had been around for too long.